I'm going to conclude the series that I've been doing on the Bible today. And I have to tell you, I've enjoyed sharing these messages, uh, but there's always this sense of depth uh, as, you, as you come to an end. I really feel like I've, we've barely put our toe into the ocean of, of things that we could discuss when it comes to growing and appreciating our Bibles. This has been the key passage throughout the series from 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul says, be diligent. You know, be diligent. You can see it's not a casual thing. Be focused, persevere, endure. Don't let anything prevent you. Be diligent, he encourages, to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need, need to be ashamed. Accurately, carefully, conscientiously handling this beautiful gift that God has given us called the Word of God. It is a, a, a charge laid on all of us. And we've gone through several of the biblical symbols for the Bible. Um, the, the, the passage that gives the subtitle for today, many places it uses similar language like this, but Hebrews chapter 4, uh, I think, is, is the one that speaks about it with the, the best clarity. It says, for the Word of God is living. It's alive. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of, of the soul and the spirit. A real sword can go deep, but the Word of God goes deeper than the physical. The Word of God delves into our very essence of what defines us in our thinking, in our character, in our spirit and in our soul, of both the joints and the marrow, marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now, that's not judge like guilty, innocent, but, but able to determine or even to influence our very thoughts and the intentions of our heart. So for our kids quiz today, we're just going to do a quick review of where we have gone with our series. Oops, I'm going to trip on that. So where are my, oh, Jaden and Toby, perfect. Toby with the slick haircut, yep, appreciate that. Jaden, who needs a haircut? All right, here we go. <laughs> so as Hebrews talked about the Word of God is living, and he compares it to a sword, we started in this series talking about the sword, but what is it? The sword of what? The sword of life, the sword of the spirit, the sword of heaven, the sword of faith. Dylan, he thinks he has this nailed down. The sword of spirit. He is right. It's the sword of the spirit, which the Bible also refers to as the word of God. This is for the kids. Raise your hand. We will get you a microphone so we can hear you. The other symbol that we talked about was the something of faith. Was it the farmer of faith, the path of faith? The seed of faith, the harvest. We're going to come to this side. They, over here, Jaden, grab one of these individuals. Abel. The seed. That's right. It's the seed of faith. Okay. In the parable of the farmer, Jesus says that the seed is also the Word of God. And so there's many elements and symbols that we could look at there. Then we went to this. The Word of God is the something of heaven. What is it? The lamp, the light. The illumination, the lantern. Okay, Dylan is all on it today. He's ready to go. Or Isaac. Isaac, that's kind of a half-hearted, but you going to go for it? The, the light? The light, he says. Dylan, what do you say? Lamp. Okay, we got light, lamp. Anyone else? Isaiah? All we need is Ellie to get most of the Asenia kids here now. Light. Light. We've got another light. One more? Did we get it or are we missing out? I see where the rest of you young people are. Don't, you, know, you can help out too, you know. Illumination. Illuminate. You know what? This is one of those ones. It's all of them, guys. It's all of them. I was kind of being silly on that one. All of these things, it is that which gives us the ability to see. Lamp, light, lantern. So then it was the bread of something. The Word of God is the bread of joy, the bread of hope, the bread of life, the bread of truth. Which one is it that we talked about? I see Nico in the back. 
Don't give him uh, uh, the bread of life. (laughs) Yes, brother, the bread of life. That was what we talked about. And then just last week, another one of the uh, symbols we talked about is that the Word of God is the refining what? The refining church, fire, power, voice. Oh, young lady right here. The refining fire. Were you even here last week? But she still knew. That is wonderful. Yes. Thank you, Jaden. Thank you, Toby. Those are the things. So we've, ta- we've covered a lot of ground, and there's more that we could cover. There's other symbols. These are the primary ones. Uh, there's others. The Bible it calls itself a hammer. It calls itself water. It calls itself uh, other, other symbols that also have importance. But today we're talking about the living word, the living word. The word of God is living and active. And so I went to Jeremiah, and here we have the statement introducing the new covenant. And this is what Jeremiah says. This is the covenant. It's a big churchy spiritual word, the covenant. This is the promise. This is the plan. This is how it all works, okay? That don't, don't get lost in, in, in the, the language here. The covenant means this is God's promise to how He's going to solve the issue of sin. This is the covenant, the new covenant, okay, which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law where? Okay, it says right up here, are you following? <laughs> I will put my law where? in us. Now, this has God's been His plan all along. He originally put His law on stone. Do you remember that? The permanence of stone. It was written by the finger of God. The fire of God, the Spirit of God writes the original tablets, right? And then the rest of the law, the rest of the prophets, the rest of the information God gave to prophets to write down, and we hold it in our hands today, right? Here it is. This is the law. The law means more than just the Decalogue. The law means more than just the writings of Moses. The law is the character of God. The law is the plan of God. The law describes God's way of dealing with sin. It describes His holiness and His love. And it's right here. It's all right here. But this isn't where God wants it. He wants it right here. If it stays here, or if it only comes here, it will not have its ultimate effectiveness and be able to be as productive in our lives and in the lives of others that God wants to use us to show His love. I will put my law inside, within them, and on their heart I will write them. And when that happens, in that process... As this is going on, a beautiful relationship forms because he says, and I will be their God and they will be my people. They will be my people. As the word of God moves from the pages of your Bible, goes through your cognitive intellectual ascent and begins to transcribe itself onto the living character of your heart, and grows and becomes alive, then you are living in the new covenant relationship with God. Does that make sense? You've heard it before probably, but this is, this is the whole point of the journey. This is the entire uh, uh, you know, pinnacle. Pinnacle Peak is where the ladies are going to walk tomorrow. The whole pinnacle of the journey of having scriptures, of being diligent to be approved workmen of God, accurately handling the word is not just so that it can sit in the pages of your Bible, but it becomes alive as it comes in your heart. I'm going to start preaching here in a minute. I haven't even started yet. Second Corinthians now, move to the New Testament. Paul picks up on this language. He's writing to the Corinthian church. Notice what he says here. He says, you, church, you believers, you Corinthians, you are our letter. You're our epistle. That's the Greek word there, but it means letter. You are our letter that we have given. It comes from our hearts to you, and you are known and read by all men. 
He's telling the Corinthian church, your life, your receiving of the gospel that we have given to you has turned you into a letter, has turned you into a word, has turned you in your lives into a message. And guess what? Everyone's reading that message. Now you say, well, that's not fair. I don't want people reading me. I don't want people judging me. I don't want people to determine, you know, their relationship with God just because of of me. Well, guess what, friends? That's how it works. Whether you like it or not, you have influence. No matter how reclusive you are, no matter how introverted you are, no matter how precocious you are, you have influence. The question is, how are you using that influence? And what are people receiving through that influence? He goes on to say, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ. When God writes His law on your hearts, when His character is being refined in your being, you become this to the world. You become God's message, not to beat people over the head with it, not to be some super spiritual monk or anything like that, but through the peaceful, humble, gentle journey as we see Christ in His work, so we partner with Christ in the same work, and people read the message of God through us. How is the Bible alive? It's alive in you, if you let it, if you, if you let it. He says, you are a letter of Christ, cared, not for, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God on the tablets of stone, not on tablets of stone, rather, but on tablets of the human heart. God takes the Word, and He writes it on our hearts. And through the miracle of the Spirit, not by our merits or our righteousness or by our perfection by any means, God uses us to be a message to keep His Word alive. Alive. One more passage from 2 Corinthians. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? We are the temple of the living God, of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them. And walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Use this the same language from Jeremiah in the New Covenant. As long as we have the Spirit in us, and as long as His Word is inscribed in us, then God is alive and working through us. That is the destination of the journey, friends. It's not just so that you can say, hey, I've been studying Daniel, and man, do I know the prophecies, and woo, I got it. Or I've been studying the parables and I know what's going on with all those object lessons, but you keep it to yourself or you don't allow it to transform you. What good is it? What good is it? Well, it's good for your own personal journey, but if it's not turning you into the message God wants you to have, it's certainly something that we can be worked on. Now, I've used this illustration before, and I see some of you looking up here going, where did that come from? Okay, when I was 10 years old, I loved the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah, yeah. Boy, I say things and I don't get an amen, but when I say the turtles, all of a sudden, the hallelujahs are rolling. I was 10 years old. Now, you know, kids go through phases. Uh, this is really going to date me. Before this, it was He-Man. Any? Okay, he, oh, yes, a couple nods of heads. But at 10 years old, man, Teenage Mutant Turtles just took me over as a kid, and you didn't have to ask me if I liked them. It was written all over me. I had the pajamas. I had the underwear. I had the toys. I had the bed sheets. I I made the weapons, okay? Any stick will suffice, you know, for a katana, and I would make the nunchucks out of the paper towel roll, you know? My my mom would allow that because you really couldn't hurt anyone with the, you know, the paper towel roll. Tied together with some tape or string, and and I had the whole, you know, shmear. I played the video games. I even began to talk like the turtles. What is the word that goes with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Cowabunga. See, some fellow turtleites out there. Cowabunga, radical, tubular, bodacious. 
right? Ten years old. Nobody had to ask me, what do you love? They didn't have to ask me. It was written all over me. They knew that I loved the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. By the way, there's nothing wrong with having hobbies and affinities and things like that. Some of you, I know who your favorite football team is. You don't have to tell me. It's written on your clothing. It's written on your vehicles. You post it on your websites or on your, you know, Facebook and things like that. And that's fine. I, you love your team. Um, some of you, I know who you're going to vote for. All right? Some people put the, the, the placards in their yard. All right? Or they join chat groups. Or it's just part of their language. Hey, did you watch the debate? Yeah, da, 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 da. No one has to ask you who you're going to vote for. It's written all over you, right? Uh, you, you know, I, again, uh, turtles, when I was 10, uh, a thing I was just talking with my wife with a little bit um, not too long ago. How many of you remember the, the uh, and I'm not endorsing television, don't get me wrong here, it's just part of our, our culture. Uh, there was a TV show called Friends, okay? Oh, pff, wow, <laughs> no shame. <laughs> when I say the Rachel. Do you know what I mean? The Rachel. Okay. I just read, uh, 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 what does it call people that cut your hair? Beauticians? Uh, stylists? Hairdresser? Okay. Hairdresser. That's the word I'm going to use. Hairdresser said in the 90s that 40%, 40% of the women's haircuts were the Rachel. You know, the yeah, can you picture? No, don't do that. <laughs> you don't have to ask them, do you like friends? It's written on their face. The way we engage with, and again, I'm not here to say that any of these things, having our hobbies, our interests, but the question I have for you is, is it okay that I know who your favorite football team is, but I don't know who your Lord is? Is it okay that I know who you're passionately going to vote for, but I have no idea about the God that you worship? Where does your relationship with God and where do the scriptures fit in your heart? If you can share it with people throughout your lifestyle, all the things that you love, your restaurants and your, your, your politics and your sports and your toys but people cannot see your Lord? We need to find a better balance. We need to let the Word of God take prominence because we have influence. Again, there's balance here. This isn't about being preachy to everyone we see and being judgmental and looking down on people because we're more spiritual than others. This is about how the Word of God will become part of your everyday language and of your life. And people won't have to ask, who do you love? They'll know because you talk about God. You share that you are part of a church. You talk about your Bible study. We all know the passage, by beholding we become changed, the phrase. It comes from 2 Corinthians 3. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. As we engage with the Scriptures, as we engage with the Spirit of God, He is transforming us. If we're not being transformed, is because we have not engaged with the Lord through worship, through prayer, through Bible study. And we're being transformed. Notice what Paul says. We're being transformed into, this is, this is heavy. We're being transformed, he says, into the same image from glory to glory. What image is he talking about? The glory of the Lord. Heavy responsibility there, isn't it? Nobody's perfect. I get it. Every now and then the swear word slips out. Every now and then we laugh at the joke we shouldn't laugh at. Every now and then we're growing in our faith. We're growing in grace. I understand it. But if the dominant part of our walk with Jesus Christ is lost in the shadow of our fallenness and our brokenness, we need to engage more in that journey with God. If you truly believe in Him as your Lord and Savior and you want to have that assurance that 
We are His people, and He is our God. By beholding, we become changed. I did not invent this. I read this from somewhere else, okay? There are five Gospels. Have you heard this before? There are five. We know of the four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the four. They tell us the story of Jesus. They're known as the four evangelists, the four gospels. But did you know that there's actually five? There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you. Now, here's here's the sobering point here, friends, and I don't want you to miss this. Here's the sobering reality. Most people will never read the first four. We are in the minority. Bible-believing, covenant-believing people, even in a nation like the United States of America, founded on the ancient principles of the Judeo-Christian ethic, we are in the minority of our community that still cherishes and reads this book. You, you realize that, right? Many people have it on the nightstand. Many people might have a, 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 a poster on their wall or a beautiful frame picture with a passage that they like. But very few Americans really study and read their Bible anymore. As a matter of fact, I have a friend who decided to get his doctorate in ministry And when he was going through the doctoral process, they said, well, what do you want to focus on? He says, I'm going to focus on missiology, missions. They said, great. What region, what area of the world, what missionary focus are you going to look at? And he says, I'm going to focus on the United States of America. And they said, you can't. You cannot do a doctoral doctoral dissertation on missiology in the United States of America. America is not a mission field. And he pushed back and he said, let me prove it to you. And so he did. Paul Diptal did his doctoral dissertation on the United States as a mission field. And the research and the evidence that he found is that less than 4% of of Americans really know anything about Christianity in the Bible. 4%. 4%. People will see Jesus through you long before they will ever crack open the Bible. What are they reading? Sobering. We need the grace of the Holy Spirit, don't we? It's shock. I mean, I get nervous, you know, just thinking about what my children see in me at times. But God writes His character on us because He knows, friends. He knows. He knows how much He needs us. Time grows short. The the Lord Jesus Christ is returning soon. And He needs us to cherish His Word to the point that it does flow through us to others because that will be the initial connecting point for most who come to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. Very few people are like Doug Batchelor who just find a Bible in a cave (laughs) or read a Gideon's Bible in the hotel and all of a sudden they just are, you know, again, God works through mysterious ways. I don't mean to say that doesn't happen or isn't significant, but that is the minority He needs you. He needs you to be a student of this Scripture so that He can transcribe His journey and His purpose in you. The Word of God is living and active when it's alive in you, when it's not just in your head or intellectually thought about. It's alive when you are being transformed by its message and become the living message. The Word of God is alive and active when people read Christ in you. The Bible is banned in public schools and derided by most of academia. The Bible is mocked by media. It's trivialized by Hollywood. It's over-aggrandized in most of television, but it's alive in you. 
The Bible is scorned by science, hated by humanists, attacked by atheists, and spoiled by spiritualists. But it's alive in you. God's Word is veiled in many churches and pulpits today. It's devalued in the courtroom, and it's devalued in the halls of Congress. It's ignored by the majority of the people who go about their business every day, but it is alive in you. God needs you to take His Word and drive it into your spirit, transform you. It will bless you. And it will bless the community God wants you to reach. God's Word is alive. It's alive. It's alive in you. Have you made it your decision? Have you made it your purpose to let this Word inspire you every day? every day. We, it is the bread of life, it is what we need to eat from every day. It's the sword of the Spirit. It's what we use to protect ourselves from the assault of the devil. It's the light of heaven that shows us our path. It's the seed of faith that grows. It's organic. It has life inside of it. It's the refining fire that burns away the dross and turns us into who God wants us to be. It's the power source. Don't let it just sit in your backpack on your shelf, on your nightstand, put it in your heart. And you will see the power of God come alive in you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have such a privilege and a calling. When you invite us into your family, it is to be engaged it's not just to be a recipient of your grace. It's not just to be someone who benefits from your truth and your power, but it is to be part of a ministry, of a fellowship, of an army that is called to go out and bless those around us. When all others struggle with hate, we can have a message of hope. When others are struggling with fear, we can have a message of courage. When others are divided, we can have unity. We can represent you in a world that is de desperate to see something better, something eternal, something that's worth living for. Heavenly Father, please, may your people continue to grow in their appreciation and devotion to the living word. Change our hearts. Change my heart, Lord that I would grow to be more like you. For your name's sake, for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.